could sound strange maybe to one or two. And Father, I really believe that you have put in every word to me and laid it so strongly upon me. And I believe it's for us right now. It's going to give us a wonderful picture of what you have ahead for us. And so, Lord, we just bow in your holy presence tonight. And we say thank you, Jesus. Amen. Mm, amen. The words I want to say to you right now are simply these. From here we move. Don't look behind. We see horizons. You may have heard me mention that before. But I really believe God wants to make this so real to us tonight. Amen. From here where we are tonight, we move. Don't look behind. Because in front of you there are great horizons. Amen. And God's about to do something on this earth that's going to be so big and so spectacular and so dynamic that if we knew exactly what it was, we would hardly be able to breathe. And I believe we're right upon that time now. But I'm going to have to lay a little foundation for what I want to take you. I want to just open up my heart to you. And I want to give maybe some of you that are here at the school at the moment, there's only a few of us here tonight, I kind of say because I like them all to have heard a little bit about, you know, how we got started and, uh, and everything, but uh, they'll pick it up, I guess, as we go along. But I want to invite you tonight to be part of a legacy, a wonderful legacy that has and I believe will continue to impact eternity as we fulfill the divine mandate that God has given to us by His Spirit. Now this mandate is very specific. It's kind of centered around a little bit of what you've heard before as far as our mission statement is concerned. But I want to just open up the mission statement a little bit more to you here tonight. Because originally, our, our mission was that we were here to glorify God and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we were here to assist the church to fulfill its mandate preaching the gospel, hallelujah, and making disciples of all nations. Now that's quite a, an amazing statement. That's what we were here for. We weren't here to go and plant churches at that time when we started, but we were here to assist the church to fulfill its mandate in preaching the gospel and in making disciples of all nations. And then out of that was birthed the other part of our mission statement, which most of you know that we're here tonight, we're here to prepare servant leaders for end time global harvest. We manifest the character and the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we minister in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And so we're committed to do this, and this is basically why we're here, amen. And I just want to say it's been our commitment to face mission and God's instructions that has kept us on course and will continue to do so in the future. Hallelujah. An appreciation of our past, I just said before, don't look behind, but an appreciation of our past is critical for charting a course for our future. So there are times where we do have to look back, but we don't dwell back there. Amen? Hallelujah. But the glimpse backward is vital to moving forward. And I want to make this so real to you tonight, you know. See, our God is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the God of beginnings. He's the God of endings. When we got started, even in our little practice here tonight, before most of you folk came in, it didn't sort of begin very, very well. But boy, it ended very well, amen? Because God is present here with us. And... Um, I've discovered that God is the God of good beginnings, but he's also the God of good endings. Amen? And one of the verses I love on that is Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 8. Ecclesiastes 7 and 8, it says, The end of a thing is better than its beginning. Just meditate on that. You can meditate on that for an hour or two, really. You know? But it's very, very true as you even think of your own life. Um, what have we got here? 
Whether it's the end of a thing and the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit, oh, isn't that beautiful? It's better than the proud in spirit. Amen. So the end of a thing is better than its beginning. And the prophet Haggai, in Haggai 2, in verse 9, and some of you will be familiar with this, it's a great verse for this hour, you know. He says, the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former. Hallelujah, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. I'm not saying it. The Lord of hosts said it. Amen. He's the Lord of armies. Amen, he is. And in this place, he says, will I give peace. Don't you love that? Say the Lord of hosts. Oh, hallelujah. What's he saying? The glory of the latter house, the last day house, is going to be far more glorious than the glory of the former house. And at Pentecost, when the former house was started, it was glorious. Amen? It was a great move of God. Hallelujah. But the glory of the latter house is going to be so much greater than the glory of the former. And then I can take you into Isaiah, and I love it so much, but in the great end time chapter, Isaiah 60, uh, the last two verses, verse 21 says, and you might find this hard to believe, but it says, God's people will all be righteous, but also shall be all righteous. Amen? Can you imagine all of God's people on earth being all righteous? God said this is how it's going to be at the end of the age. And we need to get a glimpse of this tonight. Thy people also shall be all righteous. They'll inherit the land forever. And then he says, they are the branch of my planting. I've heard so many preachers talk about Jesus being the branch of the Lord. But no, no. Jesus is not the branch of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. It's the people who belong to Jesus. Amen. That are going to spring up in the earth in the last days. Amen. So beautiful. They're a corporate company of people just like the people that Paul talks about in his teaching in the book of Ephesians. Hallelujah. And so what does it say? What is the Lord saying about his people? My people will be all righteous. Did somebody get excited about that? <laughs> They're going to inherit the land forever. Even when you think of Israel as a nation, I'm going to take you into that to show you the land that God has given to them that no one can take away from them. Amen even though there are masses of people in the world trying to do this today. And I want you to get a hold of this tonight, amen? He says, my people are the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, so that I will be glorified. Hallelujah. God's going to be glorified in you, amen? You're the branch, you're part of the branch. The branch is joined to the vine, amen? Hallelujah to Jesus. It's very, very beautiful. And then it finishes in Isaiah 60, verse 22. A little one. If you're sitting here tonight and you feel you're just like a little one, it says the little one shall be as a thousand. Amen. And a small nation will be a strong nation. And God said, I'm going to hasten it in my time. And I looked into the Hebrew word for Israel, and I was amazed at this. And it mightn't sound much to you, but I'm just if you can just stay with me, you'll, you'll see I'm taking you somewhere here. It's a five-letter word. And the first letter in the word for Israel is the smallest letter. And the last letter is the largest letter. Amen. And I think even around that, God's giving us a picture. He's the Alpha, <laughs> and he's also the Omega. Amen. And so the journey which God took the children of Israel on, from Egypt to Sion, and this is so important for you, was in the words of the Apostle Paul, and those of us that have been through the teaching on the Feast of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 10, he tells us about the journey, and then he finishes in verse 11, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, by saying, these things are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So the things that were written about the journey of Israel from Egypt through the Red Sea, into the wilderness, and then another generation rising up and going into the Jordan River, and then into the Promised Land where there is Mount Zion. Amen? Very beautiful. All these things have been written to give you and I instruction so that we won't make the same mistakes that the early generation.
salvation made. Isn't that kind of neat? Amen. So the journey really depicts for you and I the journey of a soul from the moment of conversion, and wait for it, until, 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 what's going to follow? Until we all come into the unity of the faith and the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4.13. What a wonderful scripture. And that's the journey God's taking us on. Amen. And I somehow feel that we're living right at the end of the age now. And possibly this could be the last generation that will see the coming of the Lord. So something dynamic has to take place. Amen. And this is an amazing scripture. Hallelujah. At Pentecost, there was the unity of the Spirit. Jew and Gentile even went into the same church together. It never happened before. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. It was the unity of the Spirit. But God is getting ready to bring us into the unity of the faith until we all come. Could we all say it together? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the fullness of the stature of Christ. And there are little arrows going all the way through that particular verse of Scripture. First word, until, is a time word. I'll talk more to you about that in a few minutes. Until we all come and let us into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. It seems out of the realm of possibility for that to happen. But this is God's word, and his word is truth. Would somebody say amen? <laughs> so before a person arrives at spiritual sion, they must first pass through. You know the journey. They celebrated Passover in Egypt. Then they went through the Red Sea. They had to leave the world. They had to leave Egypt, go through the Red Sea, which is a type of water baptism to us. They came into the wilderness, and they came to another mountain. Mount Horeb was in in uh, in Egypt, that was the Mount of Egypt. But in the wilderness, it was Mount Sinai. But in the Promised Land, it's Mount Sion. There are three mountains there. Amen. Hallelujah. Very very interesting on the journey. And so when they came to Mount Sinai, they celebrated the first feast of Pentecost, and three thousand people died on that day. Amen. And some of you know the story of that. And that typifies to you and I uh, water baptism and the crossing and then Holy Spirit baptism in the wilderness. In the wilderness. The charismatic Pentecostal church as we know it is still in its wilderness journey. Hallelujah. And God doesn't want us to just remain in the wilderness. He wants to bring us out in the power of His Spirit. Amen. Into everything He's been preparing for us. And so here's a couple of verses on the wilderness that may interest you. Deuteronomy 8.2. And Moses is speaking. He says, And you will remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness. And he led them to what? To humble you. <laughs> and to prove you. To know what was in your heart, whether you would obey his commandments or not. And then you go down into verse 16. And it says, Who fed you. And don't you love this? He fed you in the wilderness with manna. That was angels' food. Amen. Everything they needed was provided for them to keep them in good health in that manna that God sent down from heaven. Amen. Daily for them. Which your fathers knew not. That he might humble you, that he might prove you, and to do you good at your latter end. So here again we see God is interested in how we end. Most of you have made a good beginning. <laughs> But your good beginning is not going to be like your ending. And God wants it to be more than good. Amen. He wants to do every one of us good in our latter end. And so that's why my favorite verse at the moment is most of the ones that are at school here know as Psalm 78, 72. Where it says, he will feed you according to the integrity of his heart. And he'll guide you by the skillfulness of his hands. Isn't that a beautiful little passage of scripture? Hallelujah. 
So then they had to move through the wilderness, and that first generation died, as most of you know there, apart from Joshua and Caleb. And then the new generation began to rise up, and they approached the Jordan River crossing, and it was there that they experienced what we would call tonight heart circumcision. And God is bringing the church to a place where it must come in fresh repentance before him, before he'll allow us to enter into what Mount Zion represents in the promised land. Amen. And the promised land, and this is so interesting, folks, it's called Canaan's land. And if you study the word Canaan, it means to bend the knee. And those that are in the prayer class know we were talking a bit about that the other day, how Paul had a responsibility, he said, to bend his knee in prayer before God. So Canaan's land, it means to be in the knee. It's like God bringing us into a place of submission. Amen. It's very beautiful. And the land is also called Eula land. And the, word, the meaning of the word Eula is married. Amen. A land that is married. And coming into the land means we're coming into a place of communion and intimate fellowship with our Lord God. Amen. I'd love to read you that verse because it's interesting. Isaiah 62 and verse 4. <laughs> Just look at this. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken. Maybe somebody needs to hear that tonight. Amen. <laughs> Neither shall thy land be termed any more desolate. <laughs> Des doesn't like being late, I can tell you that. <laughs> but that's desolate. Amen. <laughs> But you shall be called Hephzibah, and thy land will be called Beulah. For the Lord delights in you. And that's what Hephzibah means. The Lord delights in you. Amen. This is a good word for you tonight. Amen. The Lord delights in every one of you that are here. And your land will be married. So it's like God brings us into a place of communion and intimate fellowship with himself. And as most of you know, the land is also called Emmanuel's land. We had an Emmanuel here a few weeks ago, amen. And the meaning of Emmanuel's name, as we all know, is God with us. So he's bringing us into a land. It's the land of his presence, amen. Oh, I love that, don't you? Amen, the land of his presence. Now, in the land, they had to conquer enemies. They were enemies within. They were enemies without. But they were going to finally enter into the rest of God, which is like ascending Mount Zion. And if you do a study on Zion, I tell you, it's so beautiful. You know, Mount Zion speaks to us of the fullness of God's presence, the fullness of God's power, and the fullness of God's anointing. I'm talking fullness there. So beautiful. So beautiful. Caleb, of course, entered in because he wholly followed the Lord. God said, Caleb has another spirit. He's a man who has fully followed me. He will enter into the land, and his seed will follow him. That was so beautiful about him. He was pretty old at that time. Amen. But let me just show you a few verses on Zion that may really bless you. Psalm 132, verse 14. <laughs> this is God speaking. He says, this is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. So when we talk about we're marching to Zion, we need to realize what it's all about. Amen? Hallelujah. Zion is God's dwelling place. Don't you love that? Mm -hmm. Look at Psalm 50 and verse 2. Oh, just look at this word. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shined. He's going to shine. He's going to manifest himself through the people of Zion in these last days. Amen? And you are precious sons of Zion. We read of that in Lamentations 4 too. The precious sons of Zion are comparable to fine gold. They're the work of the hands of the potter. You're a precious son. You're a precious daughter of Zion. You're comparable or valuable like fine gold. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, get excited about that. A precious son of Zion. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty. God will shine forth. Now, the book of Obadiah, just one chapter of this book, you know, but I'm going to take you to verse 17. It's so exciting, folks. I want somebody just to show a little bit of excitement. <laughs> <laughs> you might be wondering where I'm taking you, but just be excited. Just stay with me, please. But on Mount Zion, 
there shall be deliverance. In other words, all the people that come up to Mount Zion will be people who have experienced deliverance in their lives. So don't be ashamed if you have to be delivered from something. Amen. Because those that are coming up to the top of Mount Zion are people who know deliverance. And it says, and there shall be holiness. There's a lack of holiness in the, you know, the charismatic outpouring. It was a great move of the Spirit. But it didn't bring forth a whole company of people walking in holiness. But I tell you, this third experience is going to bring it to pass. Amen. And there will be holiness in the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. Isn't that awesome? Do you want to possess your possessions? Amen. The things that God's got for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we're going to come up to Mount Zion. Now go to verse 21, the last verse. And this last verse is right, rather almost mind-boggling. It says, saviors. It gives a picture. The prophet Obadiah sees saviors. If you study the word, it means little saviors. Amen. <laughs> Nobody will ever take the place of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. But little saviors are going to come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall become the Lord's. And that's how we read in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, towards the end of everything. Revelation 11, 15, it says, And the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. I wonder who his Christ is. It means his anointed ones, plural. And he will reign forever and forever. Isn't that so powerful? Can you say amen to that? Amen. And let me give you one more on Isaiah. Isaiah 8 and 18. Isaiah had this revelation, you know, and he knew without a shadow of a doubt God had marked him and his sons out for a particular purpose. Just like I want you to see tonight, God has marked you out for a particular purpose. You've been chosen for greatness, every one of you that are here tonight. And in Isaiah 8, 18, it says, Behold, I, this is Isaiah speaking, and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel, from the Lord of hosts who dwells where? In Mount Zion. It's the place of his rest. It's the place of his habitation. Oh, don't you love that? Yep. Uh, you see, the journey had been conceived in the heart and mind of God before the foundation of the world. The journey of the children of Israel. When the children of Israel went into Egypt, there were only 70 people. They were there for 430 years, and when they came out, there were at least two and a half million people. Boy, they had been multiplied, amen. <laughs> wow, they had been multiplied. Wow. And what I want you to see is that Abraham was the father of the Jewish race, as we know, and not only of the children of Israel, but he's spoken of as being the father of all those who have accepted Jesus as their saviour. And it's amazing to discover that Adam was born, sorry, Abraham was born in the year 1948 years after Adam was created by God, the father of Israel. Hallelujah. Wow. What happened after Christ's life? What happened in 1948 AD? Israel became a nation again. Don't you think God is saying something to us there? Now, here's the interesting thing I want you to really pay full attention to this. You know, the covenant that God made with Abraham in Genesis 15 involved a promise to give all the land of Canaan to Abraham and his seed. Now, in those days when people made covenants, even when men made covenants with men, what they would do is that they would kill an animal and they would separate the animal and put one half of the animal on one side and one half of the animal on the other side and the two people that were making covenant together would walk through in between those animals and came back out again and that sealed the covenant. Now in this covenant that God made with Abraham something very unusual happened that hadn't ever happened before. And it's so incredible when you see it. Uh, 
because this covenant that was made in Genesis 15 was a covenant in the most unusual manner. And uh, instead of God and Abraham walking through, which would have been the automatic thing to happen when God made a covenant with somebody, there were two people that walked through. But one of them wasn't Abraham. And we kind of, kind of wonder why. And I'll read it to you here in Genesis 15, 12. I want you to see what happened to Abraham when he was on the verge of perhaps the most amazing moment of his life. And God was about to bring him into the fullness of his life and ministry. You know? And in Genesis 15, 12, we read, And when the sun was going down on this historic moment of time, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. That's unusual, isn't it? Imagine what it must have been like for him. Even the wording of it, a great horror, a great darkness. There must have come a feeling of helplessness in Abraham's life. How was he going to be able to fulfill this covenant that God was going to make with him? Amen. And you'll often find that you'll have a similar sort of experience. I'm not saying you'll fall asleep. <laughs> but you'll certainly have feelings of helplessness when God is wanting to bring you up to a higher level than where you've been living right up until this moment of time. And so he fell asleep. And uh, then we read this amazing thing that happened. Amen. God was making a promise to him that was literally going to affect not only the future of millions of his own seed, the Jewish people, but the whole of mankind. And what's going on over in the Middle East today? What are they trying to take away from Israel? That part of the land that the Palestinians have. Amen. And uh, so let me just go on and explain a bit further to you so you can see something here. The promise wasn't going to depend upon Abraham and his seed. But it was going to be the responsibility of God the Father and of Jesus Christ the Son of God. Amen. For Abraham never passed through the divided animals because he was in a deep sleep and the horror of great darkness was upon him. So two other parties must have passed through. And I want you to see who those two other parties were. Genesis 15, 17 and 18, please. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between those pieces. I don't know what you think of that. This was on the same day that the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said to him, Unto your seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now, the smoking furnace is a symbol of our God who's called, as Hebrew says, our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Oh, the burning lamp is none other than the person of Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus Christ was here on earth, he says, I am the light of the world. Hallelujah. So in actual fact, the promise that God gave is not dependent upon Abraham and his seed, hallelujah, <laughs> because it was the Father and the Son who agreed together to give them the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And you're going to hear a lot more about that land in the days that are right ahead of us, but you can be sure that God will be true to the covenant that he has made. Amen. It will not be taken away. And I know there are many in leadership around the world today who are attempting to make a change on that piece of land. Okay, so it's God's land. And he's given it to Israel. That's interesting. Now I'll come back to Faith Bible College. Faith Bible College was founded on a prophetic word and burst out of a move of God in New Zealand after the outpouring of the Spirit in 1967, which was called the Charismatic but think of the years that have gone by since then. 
And you know, 40 years after uh, uh, what took place in the wilderness, amen, a new generation entered into the promised land. And I believe we're entering now into what's called the Feast of Tabernacles, which most of you know is called the Feast of Unity, a Feast of Joy, a Feast of the Restoration of Backsliders, a Feast of Ingathering, a Feast of Rest, a Feast of Glory, and it's called the Feast of His Appearing. Amen. And in New Zealand today, we have thousands of backsliders. But I tell you, something's about to happen in this nation and in the nations of the earth. Amen. And I believe what God's going to be doing now is going to be so big, it's going to be so awesome, it's going to be so spectacular, that there's only one person who can ever believe for this to take place, and that's God himself. Amen. <laughs> and this is why he wants to increase our faith, folks. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I tell you, when I mention something like that, I know it affects the brain people. And I love affecting the brain people. And I think you know what I mean by the brain people. People have got everything all worked out. Because my word says, and your word says, it's not my might. <laughs> it's not my power. But it's by my spirit. Yes, the Lord. Isn't that awesome? And this is why I believe that God's moving us now and has to move us from charismatic Pentecostal Christianity into a new season. Hallelujah. That he's preparing for us where he'll give us a harvest way beyond our wildest dreams. And I know you've heard me say before, you've got to get ready because the Holy Ghost is something that's coming again. I talked the other day, just in class, and mentioned to the, the new students that were in, and some of them, it was something new for them, you know, that a day in the sight of the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. And they all said, I'd love you to teach us more about it. And I, I, I was expecting them to be here tonight, and I, I don't see many of them here. So my heart is feeling really, really sad. But I'm going to just give you two or three third-day scriptures. Uh, because Jesus was here two days ago. Amen. The day of the sight of all is as a thousand years. And I'll be very quick on this, because one or two have heard some of these. But in Exodus 19, way back in the time of Moses, God told Moses to tell the people to go home, and to wash their clothes, and to get ready for the third day. Because he said, on the third day, I'm going to come down in the midst of my people. They went home and washed their clothes. I'm not telling you to go home tonight and wash your clothes, but that could mean something else to you that maybe you need to do. Amen? He wants us to have hearts that are purified. Amen? Because on this day, we're living in the third day from Jesus now, which is the seventh day from Adam, it's the Lord's day, we're about to see what our God's going to do. Amen. Amen. And it's going to be magnificent. Amen. And then, as you go on in that chapter, you find there came an earthquake, and the mountains were shaking, and God came down and visited the people on the third day. And the whole nation fell on their faces before God. It's an incredible passage of Scripture. And then Hosea 6, 2 and 3, the great prophet Hosea, he says, after two days... Two days have gone by in the economy of God since Jesus was here. And the prophet says, after two days, God will revive us and he will raise us up and he will live in our sight. And if we follow on to know him, this is something we have to do, he will come into us as the early and the latter rain. Imagine the early and the latter rain. I tell you, coming down upon God's people, Joel prophesied that would happen in the last days, that God would cause the early and the latter rain to come down upon his people before he poured out his spirit upon all flesh. Powerful stuff, you know. Don't you want to be filled <laughs> with the early and the latter rain? And then I'll, I'll just give you one over into, into the, I'll turn over into the New Testament. In, in John chapter 2, you know the story of the wedding at Cana. It just so happened, or did it just so happen? I think it was orchestrated by God, you know. There was a wedding held on the third day. The wedding at Cana. They'd run out of wine. And the governor of the feast was so concerned because there was no wine left. He talked to Mary, and the mother of Jesus. And Mary said some great words, you know. And just passed back these words. Just, just, just do what Jesus tells you to do. 
they may not be sure they'll live by that, you know, just do what Jesus tells you to do. And Jesus told them what to do, and you know the story. They get six pitchers of water, fill them to the brim, and then they pour the book water out, take it to the garden of the feast. And it was still water, even after what they did that Jesus told them to do. But when the water was poured out, it became the best wine. And for wine to be its best, some of you might know that for wine to be at its best, it's got to be mature. So that water became mature wine in an instant of time. And the Bible says there in John 2, this was the beginning of the miracles Jesus performed and he manifested his glory. And I believe we're going to see God manifesting his glory in the day we're living in now. Amen. And it's going to be the beginning of miracles, maybe in your lives. Amen. And God has kept the best wine to the last. Amen. I'll get on to that in a few moments here. Just one more in the Gospels of Luke. Uh, disciples told Jesus, this is in Luke 13, 32, Herod is out to kill you. Get out of the way, Jesus. He's out to kill you. And Jesus, I love what he said, you know. If you just go into Luke 13, 32, he said to them, you go and tell, and I looked up that word fox, and it really means you go and tell that old fox. I love the way Jesus speaks, you know. You go and tell that old fox. Behold, I'm casting out demons and I'm healing the sick. Today, that's one day, and tomorrow, that's the second day, and the third day, I shall be perfected. So, I know it's hard to understand, but God is going to be perfecting the people. Jesus is going to be perfected. In the saints, amen. It's going to happen in the day or season we're entering into now. So I'd like to just say this to you. God is moving us from being, I haven't even talked to staff about this, but in a sense, I kind of believe this, you know. He's moving us from a Pentecostal charismatic sort of frame of mind, Bible school, into a place of being as a company of mature sons and daughters of God so as we can fully represent the Father in character and in likeness and be as John says in 1 John 4 17 because as Jesus is so are we in this world hallelujah <laughs> we thought we are going to become like him when we get to heaven now, what's going to bring him back is there's going to be a people here on earth who will be like him. So we have a destiny, and I'd like to proclaim it tonight, which is called maturity. Woo. This is what we're heading towards now. Amen. Hallelujah. Until we all come into the unity of the faith. Yeah. Hallelujah. And the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. We've got to move into this. Amen. You have a destiny, amen. It's a high calling of God that's on your life. And this is what I want to bring you as a little word of warning here. Because of the hour we're living in, the relationships we keep and the partnerships we form are tremendously important in this season. Tremendously important, amen. You know, the sea in the season will determine, like the people, the people that we move around with are going to determine whether or not we have the internal capacity to carry the move of God in this hour. And this is why, you know, when you get really connected with people, uh, be very careful who you get connected with. Make sure you're connected with people who are carrying the same thing that you're carrying in your heart. Amen. And that's why I, I, I we hear a lot of teaching on God is looking for a new wineskin to to carry his new wine. He's keeping the best wine for the last, amen. Don't you want to be a dispenser of the best wine, amen? Uh, hallelujah. The old wineskin cannot carry the power and the strength of the new season we're coming into. We've been a, a, a charismatic Pentecostal wineskin for many, many years now, and it's been very good. And I believe God wants us not to rubbish that, but to carry the very best of what we've learned into this new season. Amen. And that's why I say from here we move. <laughs> Don't look behind. We see horizons and God is saying now is the time. 
Now listen to these few verses here. Psalm 102, verse 13. Oh, don't you love this? The Lord will arise and have mercy on who? On Zion. Amen. Here it comes again. The true people of God. The Lord will arise and have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her. Yea, the set time has come. And since this turn of the century, there's been a lot of teaching in churches about two words for time. Chronos, this speaks of chronological time, what we see on our watches right now, if you look, amen. And we're going a little later tonight, but just bear with me, you're going to enjoy this if you stay with me. But, but then there's the word kairos. And I believe God wants us to have kairos partnerships now. Kairos moment is a definitive <coughs> moment in time. And if we're going to really become what God's marked us out to be, we must be moving with people who are carrying the same thing, did I say, in their womb. Amen? In their womb. Hallelujah. I put down here in my notes today, our internal capacity to carry the new wine of this new season can be largely <coughs> determined with whom we hang out with. And some people, some Christian people are hanging out with people they shouldn't be hanging hindering their progress in God. So we need to get close to the people who are carrying the new thing that God said he would do in this season. Isaiah 43, 19, God says, hallelujah, what does he say? Behold, I will do a new thing, saith the Lord. Now it shall spring forth, and it will spring forth speedily. Oh, don't you love that? No, I don't see the speedily there, but I thought it was there. <laughs> I've added it, I'm sorry. But behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I'll even make a way for you in the wilderness, and I'll cause rivers to flow in the dry desert areas of your life. Amen. Wow. What about verse 20? Why is he going to do this? It says, firstly, it says, The beasts of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because they give waters in the wilderness. And rivers in the desert, but his purpose is to give drink to his people, his chosen ones. God is going to do, do a new thing. It's going to break forth, spring forth now, so that you will be able to give drink, and you'll be able to refresh and revive the people of God. Amen. In this third day, amen. Hallelujah. And God is right there to do it through you. After two days, he says, I'll revive you. <laughs> And I'll raise you up, and you will live in my sight. And if you follow on to know me, I'll come unto you as the early and the latter rain. We're going to have so much rain, so much of his word, so much of his spirit to give out to people who so desperately, desperately need it. So I, I've been trying to work out, because I know that with every great move of God there's been, there's always been a certain sound. And we all know that in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, on the day of Pentecost, there came a sound, and the sound was of a mighty, rushing wind. And I still don't know if I've got the answer on this, but I feel it's going to be a sound that's going to be made that will cause, if we were pregnant, a babe to leak in our wombs. Do you understand what I mean? And I want to show you a wonderful Kairos partnership that was made between two women in the New Testament. And you probably know who I'm talking about. It's Mary and Martha. Mary and Elizabeth, sorry. Now, when Mary discovered that within her womb was the Christ child, she also knew she wasn't really the principal carrier of that new move. There was another person who was a principal carrier of that move, and that, of course, was Elizabeth. And they were cousins. And uh, she goes with the child within her womb. She visits Zacharias and Elizabeth. Elizabeth was further along in the pregnancy, and she was carrying John the Baptist in her womb, the one who was going to prepare the way for the first coming of the Lord. Amen. And when Mary went in, I read this afternoon, and I got a little bit of a shock because I saw Mary actually saluted Elizabeth. 
She obviously looked up to Elizabeth. Elizabeth was a partner with her. They were both carrying something within their womb. And when she saluted him, amen, and greeted Elizabeth, sorry, I said him, Luke 1, 41, if we could have it on the screen, and we read, and it happened, or it came to pass, that when Elizabeth heard, she heard something. She heard the salutation of Mary, and what happened in Elizabeth's womb? The babe leaped in her womb, and the Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that was even before the day of Pentecost. She had an infilling of the Holy Spirit in her life. And the babe, that's John the Baptist, who prepared the way for the first coming of Jesus, you know, that leapt in her womb. So there's something about the sound of a new season that catches the heart of a people. Whenever God brings a new move of God in the earth, it's going to come with a sound. And so I went on in this, and I saw in verse 44, <laughs> it was a story that I hadn't taken much notice of before, and I read this, for lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation, Elizabeth says to Mary, as soon as I heard the voice of your greeting, and it sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Hallelujah. And so we need to get close to people who are carrying the same season or the same move of God in their being. Amen. I put down here, there is something about the sound of the new season that catches the heart of a people. Whenever God brings a new move of God in the earth, it comes with a sound. Amen. And to have a baby leaping with joy in the womb of a mother, what, a, what an incredible thing. Amen. For any mothers that are here. <laughs> and and they, were, they were blood relatives, but they were carrying what God was doing in that particular hour within them. So we're hearing the sound today that has never been heard in charismatic, Pentecostal Christianity. And, uh, you know, if you go on into verse 45 here, you'll see something else which is very beautiful. It says here, And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. That could be a good personal word for some of you tonight. Amen. If God's been speaking things to you. Blessed is she, but blessed is he that believes, for there will be a performance of those things which were told you from the Lord. Hallelujah. So we're living in a Kairos moment of time. You know, what does it say? Uh, uh, the time, uh, Psalm 22, verse 13, the time, I'll just have that again because there's something else I want to take you to in that. Psalm 22, verse 13. Go back to that. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Simon for the time of favor who yet the set time has come. Go into verse 15 now. Oh, hallelujah. Get ready for something. No, go into verse, we'll go into verse 14. <laughs> no, no, go into verse 16 then. Yes. Oh, yes, well, this is well, this is what's happening in this day. What's happening in this day? The servants of God are taking pleasure in her stones. No, I don't know what you take out of that. But we're all living stones. And there's something happening in the body of Christ right now. People are starting to take pleasure in each other. Starting to love each other more. Starting to be more gracious to one another. Wait a minute. And favour the dust there. I'll now come in and just go on a little bit. Verse 15. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord, all the things of the earth, for I glory. Next verse. When the Lord shall build up Zion. That's what he's doing today. He's building his people together. What's going to happen? He will appear in his glory. And jump to verse 18. This is written not just for any generation that's to come, but it's written for a particular generation of people. Oh. And the people which shall be created in this generation will be a people who praise and worship the Lord. And there's never been a generation on earth praising and worshiping God like there is today. It's incredible, folks. We are getting so close to the end of time. Hallelujah. And I think we're living in a, a major grace 
us right now. God has given us grace and love to redefine our relationships with people. We need to get excited about where we're heading and we need to get connected to those who are carrying the same baby. That might sound ridiculous to you, but I think it will mean something to you. We do. We definitely need to be connected to people like that. And I just want to close, and I need to close, but I was fascinated a few years ago when we had a visiting ministry here. We wrote a book on campus, and we called it Moses, the Master, and the Man Child and pointed out that every 2,000 years God has a son. We talked about Moses, and then 2,000 years later, Jesus the Master. But there's another group of people that we don't know very much about. And it's 2,000 years now after Jesus was here, and the man-child people is being formed and brought together. Amen. And it's extremely important for us to see this. So could I have you take us to Revelation 15? I'll do it very quickly. I'm really through. But God's not true. <laughs> <laughs> and here's John now. Oh my goodness. And I, I want you to try and picture the scene. He says, I saw as it were a sea of glass. Revelation 15, starting from verse 1 or verse 2. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. This is powerful for and I see them who had gotten the victory, them, plural, who had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, which you know is 666. True? <laughs> and we're growing up to the fullness of the statue of Jesus Christ. And his name adds up to 888, eight, eight, amen. New beginnings, new order, perfection, everything's totally back. But look at these people here. I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. I saw them who had gotten the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name. He said, I see them standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God in their hands. Amen. What are they doing? Playing on the harps, no doubt. Wouldn't you love to be able to play a harp? Worshipping God. Go to the next verse, please. And they sing. What are they singing? They're singing the song of Moses and the servant of God, which he was, and the song of the Lamb, the Master, Jesus. <laughs> and they're singing, saying, you know, I wish somebody had put this to music, you know. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of Saints. We're all part of this man-child company. We don't know very much about it. But it's what Paul calls the time that's on us now, the manifestation of the sons of God. And you know this in Romans 8, and I'll close with it. For the earnest expectation of the whole of creation is waiting for something. They probably don't even know what they're waiting for, you know. But they're waiting for the manifestation or the unveiling of the sons of God. The sons of Zion. The daughters of Zion. Hallelujah. I'm just thinking of another scripture in Zechariah where it talks about the daughters of Zion. Amen. And how the daughters of Zion cried out to God. And in that particular period of time, hallelujah, a whole nation was turned to the Lord in the day. And I really believe what God's going to be doing is going to be so big and so spectacular. We'll even see whole nations come into the Lord because of the greatness of the outpouring of God's Spirit upon the earth. Hallelujah. So I trust you've been able to put all of that together here. And I've got a very special friend here tonight, my friend Ben. <laughs> I call him, because Ben is short for Benjamin, and it means the son of the Father's right hand. And Ben, I'd just love you just to pray for us. I've got, there's a congregation, but they, you know, when it is on your heart, would you do that for us? Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Maybe you can just hold hands with the person next to you. Really lovely. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you.
fullness, we want the promises, we want the promised land, or we want the inheritance. We want to possess that which is rightfully ours, God, that you won for us on the cross, Jesus. So, Lord, we ask that we surrender wholeheartedly to you, God, just as Caleb wholeheartedly followed you, yes. Lord, as you gave yes. him his land, that we wholeheartedly follow you, Jesus, and we surrender to you and say, we are yours, Lord. Use us and take us. Take us where you want us to go, Lord. Lord, we will not fear the giants of the land. We will not fear any of the we will not fear the lions. Yes. But Lord, we will just, uh, we'll we'll just place our faith and our hope in you, Lord, and we look to you and we say, Lord, oh, you're greater than anything that we can face, God. You're yes. greater than any problem. You're greater than any obstacle, God. Yes. And Lord, we look at we look at the nation of New Zealand, Lord, and we see what's happening, Lord. We're not afraid, but Lord, we say you're greater than your might. Yes, God. you are. Lord, will take this nation into fullness. All we want to invest in the hearts of Lord. We say unlock it, Lord. Yeah. Use us, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I, I, I just like just while while you're sitting, it's quarter to two, so it's, it's not too late. Um, I'd like to have that all just if we can put it on. You know, I started off with the words from here we move down with behind. Uh, we see horizons, or I see horizons. I just got a little just that. Uh, and Daughter Dion wrote a song, and some of the staff heard this maybe two or three years ago, and I haven't played it here since then. But I'd just like these words to wash over you before you leave tonight, amen. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it, amen. It's not professionally done. Her friends playing the piano, and her simply singing. She heard my preaching, and she went away and wrote the song. And it's, to me, it's very beautiful. I played it up in the school in Singapore and Malaysia this time. And they kind of went crazy on it, you know. They haven't wanted a copy of this. <laughs> so, uh, can you do that for us, Faith? Amen. It's called Now is the Time to see what your dreams are made of. Now is the time to see your destiny. Let's bring it up. That's good. Had the stream of mine for many years.
on the bottom of the card. Sorry? Just says on the bottom of the card. Um, 
records in Germany. And I made, I think I made five records in my, in my youth. <laughs> but I, I know God has put a gifting in my life and I'm so glad that he's renewed it and restoring it. So don't give up anybody who think you're too old. <laughs> you never know what he'll bring out. Amen. So God bless you. Thank you, Bess.